no, you cannot inherit acquired traits, but actually you can inherit acquired traits. That's the field of epigenetics studies that. And that, that's a radical shift in perspective, because we also don't know exactly what that means across any length of time. And when you're thinking about evolutionary lengths of time, you're thinking about three and a half billion years, because that's the span of time over which life evolved. And so even things that don't have a overwhelmingly marked potency for one generation can be unbelievably powerful across time. And then there's also the issue of sexual, sexual selection, because you know, you'll hear Darwinists continually describe the world and the evolutionary world as a place of randomness. And that's not true, it, and I don't know why they make that statement. The mutations are random, or quasi-random, because we don't understand mutations that well yet either. And most mutations are deadly, right? Most mutations are deadly, there's a set of them that are harmful but not deadly, and then there's a tiny, tiny proportion that could, in principle, produce some benefit to the next generation, assuming environmental, environmental shift, say, in the direction of the mutation. So, and that's, there's a randomness element to that. We know that, I mean, part of the reason that you mutate, or your cells mutate, your DNA mutates, is because of background levels of radioactivity. And a lot of that's a consequence of solar activity, right? So cosmic rays come zipping through the atmosphere and they nail your DNA and produce minor alterations and that's a mutation. And if you crank up the background radiation rate, like say around Chernobyl, then the mutation rate rises. And there's definitely a random element to that. And it's necessary for there to be a random element because as far as I can tell, the only way you can beat a random environment is by producing random changes, right? So, you know the idea, basically, that the, the environment isn't some static place that's selecting for higher and higher levels of fitness, or not in any, not in any, it's certainly not doing that in any static way. And so it's shifting around randomly. And then, you know, you have a structure that's been, your species has a structure that's a consequence of this immense evolutionary journey, and it's moderating itself randomly within certain parameters, the parameters being that most mutations will kill you, like alterations in your fundamental form generally tend to kill you, so they're incremental. And so the mutations are random and they match, hopefully they match the randomness in the environmental shift, and so you can more or less keep up that way. But then there's additional complicating factors, and they're not trivial, and one of them is whatever epigenetics does, we don't know anything about that yet, but the second one is sexual selection. And sexual selection is no joke. It could be the primary thing, it's certainly one of the primary things that's driven human evolution, and I think you can say that... You think about the environment, again, well, let's think about the environment. So. You have a dominance hierarchy, and that's really an old structure. The dominance hierarchy is 300 million years old, because it emerged pretty much whenever there, was, whenever there was a nervous system, emergent nervous system, and whenever animals had to occupy the same territory, they automatically organized themselves into something approximating a dominance hierarchy. So it's a very, 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 very old structure. It's older than trees. It's older than flowers. It's old. And as far as real goes from a Darwinian sense, Permanent is real. And so when you, you can say, well, you know, our boreal ancestors adapted themselves to trees, and so the tree was along, lo, around long enough to be a feature of the environment. But the dominance hierarchy has been around a lot longer than trees. And you can think of the dominance hierarchy both as an adaptation to the environment, because you'd kind of think about the dominance hierarchy as a cultural construct. But if a cultural construct lasts long enough, then it becomes part of the environment. And so the dominance hierarchy is part of the environment. And what seems to happen, roughly speaking, and this is an oversimplification, but we'll go with it, is that males have a dominance hierarchy, and there's a relatively small number of males that are relatively successful, and those successful males have preferential access to female reproductive capacity, either because the females actively choose the the more dominant males, which is very, very common, or because the more dominant males chase all the less dominant males away, so that even if the females don't exercise choice, which they often do, then the only males left around that can serve as reasonable mating partners are the more powerful ones. And so you think you get two really radical determiners of evolution as a consequence of that. One is that each I'm not talking about female dominance hierarchies at the moment. 
but I can talk about that, but that's why this is an oversimplification. But what happens is that the males obviously are selected for their ability to move up dominance hierarchies. Obviously, because the ones that are at the top of the dominance hierarchy reproduce preferentially. And so that means the male dominance hierarchy becomes a method of selection. But then, allied with that is the female proclivity for choice on whatever dimension the dominance hierarchy happens to be arranged. And so then female sexual selection also becomes a radical, um, non-random selector of, of, of what, what genetic material is going to move into the next generation. And so I, I fail to see how any of that can be separated from the emergence of complex nervous systems and mind over the course of evolution. Because people aren't, creatures aren't making random choices. They're not random at all. 